and allowing viewers to enter the presentation. So sit back, grab yourself a beverage, and we'll get the show on the road here in just a few moments. Eric, we're now live. If you want to do, uh, um, go ahead and take care of that small task. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome from the heart of Central Texas. It's a little bit after 7.30, and it's time for a break in the chain. Tonight, we have special guest speaker, Patty Wagstaff, who has come, who's coming back for the second time to this program. My name is Jeremy Walters. By now, most of you know who I am. I'm an ATP, uh, airplane, um, helicopter instructor, master CFI, major in the United States Army Reserves, and I'm an aviation content creator. I really love to teach, inspire, and motivate folks to do the right thing, go after your dreams, and do something good with your life. This is a picture of me back in the day whenever I was an 864 gun pilot, and this is a picture of me out on Lake Buchanan, Texas, having a blast in the PA-12 supercruiser on uh, Whipline 2100s. I'm supported by my beloved family. That's my wife, Talia, and our five beautiful children. We have three boys and two girls. That little Luscom 8E behind me is Miss Betsy Blue. And I, my oldest son, Adam, and I just took her all the way to the East Coast and back um, in the last five days. It was a wonderful trip. Tonight, I'm going to be assisted by uh, a great uh, local pilot, Eric Day. He is an instrument-rated private pilot, you know, aircraft owner, software engineer. And Eric has participated as a attendee in every single one of the Break in the Chain programs that we've had um, in the webinar format and on the sem in the uh, seminar format. Tonight, our guest speaker really doesn't need too much of an introduction, but I'll do that anyway. This is the protocol for every viewer, every uh, special guest speaker. Tonight, our guest is uh, the National Aerobatic Champion and Aviation Hall of Fame inductee, uh, Patty Wagstaff. Throughout Patty's career, she's been a dedicated aviation educator and performer in the mastery of aerobatics, performing at every major air show to include Air Adventure Oshkosh, uh, Sun and Fun in Lakeland, Florida. And today her company, Patty Wagstaff Aviation Safety LLC is based in St. Augustine, Texas. A uh, correction, St. Augustine, Florida. Um, and she trains pilots from all over the world on aerobatics, uh, airmanship and upset training. She continues working in the aviation field as an air show pilot, stunt pilot for films, a consultant, flight instructor and writer. Uh, Patty Wagstaff is the is on an Emirates board member of the Smithsonian Institution of the National Air and Space Museum and was on the Presidential Advisory Committee to the Centennial Flight Commission. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct honor to welcome once again to Breaking the Chain, our guests tonight, Ms. Patty Wagstaff. Patty, welcome back to Breaking the Chain. Thank you for having me again. <laughs> That's awesome. Tonight, Patty, uh, most people know of you as being an aerobatic instructor, uh, air show performer, um, passionate aviator. But uh, fewer folks know about your experiences conducting aerial firefighting. So that's some of the things that we wanted to talk about tonight. And anything else that you want to add, um, we'll have um, viewers asking questions in the chat and we'll have a good time. So, okay. Patty. Why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got your start in aviation? Uh, how I got my start, I, um, well, I grew up around aviation. I'm an airline brat. And so I was around airplanes my whole life. Um, and then when I moved to Alaska, I started flying up there. Um, I think about one of every five people are pilots in Alaska. So it was a great place to learn to fly. And I flew in Alaska for about five years before I ever flew in the States um and got my instructor rating and you know so on started teaching tailwheel and 
and uh, one thing led to another. So, and aviation was kind of the, for me, the place to be. I tried other things, traveled a lot. And, um, and when I started flying, I'm like, okay, this fits, this is where I want to stay. That's outstanding and uh, typical, uh, awesome background and aviation story. Eric, you're up. You're muted. You're muted, Eric. I see some questions on here. Oh, I already did that. Um, so that's um, so that's how you got started in aviation. Why don't you tell us about um, aerial firefighting? How did you get into that? So in 2010 or so, I was thinking about doing something different for a change. Um, flying air, I've flown air shows for a long time, and I continue to. But um, I decided that I wanted to do the, the next best exciting thing in aviation and get the best BFR flying job um, out there, and that's aerial firefighting. So I uh, interviewed, like everybody else, um, applied to fly for CAL FIRE in um, California. So most California is the only state that has a, their own firefighting program. It's very well funded. They have a lot of air, they have a number of airplanes and they have about uh, 12 bases around the state. So the idea is that they can reach a fire for initial attack anywhere in the state in within 20 minutes uh, from one of their bases. And um, so I was lucky enough to be hired. And I, of course, everybody, it's very, it's seniority. So everybody starts um starts at the low end of the totem pole there's about there's less than 100 pilots maybe 75 pilots and um and i started flying air attack so i was flying the ov-10 and the air and air attack captain uh, flies with what's called an atgs you have a experienced fighter fighter in the back that's been trained to spot fires from the air uh, ATGS stands for Air Tactical Group Supervisor, and um, and then you fly them around, and they they are the like the forward air controller, you know, in the military, um, what they would call that. They um, uh, assess the fire, bring in the other assets, request resources, other tankers, um, and basically assist the firefighters on the ground. Um, so whoever the uh, um, the IC, the, you know, whoever's in charge of the fire, they're talking to the uh, air attack and we're assisting them in putting the fire out. Um, some of the fires get really big, very, very fast. So um, when you take off, you don't know how long you're going to be up in the air. You just have to, you have to plan your fuel and you have to plan a relief. You can fly up to seven hours a day according to their rules. And um, you can be up in the air for five hours if it's a fire that's close to your base or you can be up there for 20 minutes. You can turn around and have it canceled. So you never know what you're in for. Um, you can go out to a little fire and it can become a really big fire in a very short time. And um, some fires become extended. So you're on the fire for days at a time. And, um, and sometimes you fly overtime, sometimes you don't, so on and so forth. So. Um, the OV-10, a lot of people want to know about flying the OV-10. I flew for three years, so I have quite a bit of time in it. And um, it's, I had always wanted to fly it because it's one of the really cool airplanes out there. It was designed for forward air control and uh, low level observation. And also it was armed for Vietnam and designed specifically for operations in rough fields in Vietnam. And um, it was very successful at what it did. And um, it's an unusual plane. It's got a really flat, short wing. It's tab driven. So when you move the controls, it moves these tabs that move the aileron. So you don't get much aileron. Um, you, you can move the aileron. You really, you're just moving the tabs until you get maybe 30 degrees, I think. I think it's more, but um, more uh, aileron uh, throw until you actually move the aileron because of these tabs. Um, so it's, 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 that's a whole nother, it's a little hard to explain, but, um, but it's, uh, so it's a little unconventional, uh, it's got twin garrets and the garrets are very noisy and they're perfectly suited to this mission because they're instant response, um, quicker response than a Pratt and Whitney, a lot louder though. And, uh, and, um, you know, interesting engines. Um, so 
we assisted the firefighters at our base, which were flying the S2T tankers. So it's an S2 modified with turbine engines. Um, and uh, that's what CAL FIRE uses for tankers. So, um, so I did that for three years. Every year I moved to a different base. I was in Grass Valley. I was in Santa Rosa and I was in Chico, California. And um, the season was about six months long. And then in the winter, I'd go do air shows overseas or, you know, go back to Florida and so on. So, so you, do actually, you would actually relocate to California during the fire season then, it sounds like. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm from California. So it was great to have that bird's eye view of all, you know, California. And usually we, we stayed pretty close to base, but there are days you take off and they'd say you're diverting to Fresno or you're diverting to Southern California to yeah, one of the bases down there. And so you never took off without an overnight bag. Mm. And <laughs> yeah, and you just didn't know. And you'd be gone for two or three days at some other fire and you actually could be gone for longer. It was six days on one day off until your day okay. off. Um, so it was very exciting. I love the teamwork. It's a real team, team orient, you know, team oriented job. Um, you know, you're talking to the other tankers, you're helping them, you're, it gets very busy up there because you're monitoring, I believe there were nine frequencies um, that I could monitor. There are three different radios. There are these, um, they're not shortwave radios, but they're AM, FM, and so on, that just talking to people on the ground. So sometimes, you know, I'm trying to talk to Approach where we had some fires just outside of San Francisco airspace in Walnut Creek in Oakland, and you're trying to talk to approach, you're trying to keep an eye out for commuter traffic, you're talking to a local airport, warning them, don't fly over this way, we're circling a fire, and then you're trying to listen what's going on on the ground so you can best help your ATGS in the back seat. and at times you just get saturated. You're just, okay, I've got to turn something off here, I can't, yeah, I just can't do all that, <laughs> and uh, it, it was great, it was really um, exciting, and each of the regions I flew in had their own you know, um, terrain and own topographical, you know, challenges. And uh, so Santa Rosa is all wine country and uh, a lot of hills, of course, and mountains. And, and um, when you have mountains and hills and a little bit of wind, the fire just races up the, races up the sides of the mountains really fast. In uh, Chico, we had a lot of uh, grass fires because it's a little flatter up there north of Sacramento and you get these raging grass fires. Um, that just pop up in you know very very short amount of time, and the fires would come in and sometimes back burn them, and um, it was it was great. It was super exciting. I would have stayed. I had a tanker slot, and um, but the lifestyle was difficult, um, and I wanted to do something else. So I miss it though. So that's that's really awesome. Um, that's a really good rundown of what it was like to do the, the firefighting piece. Um, one of the things I haven't mentioned to you, uh, many viewers yet um, is I used to be a firefighter myself. That's why it really intrigued me uh. combining firefighting and, and aviation. The closest thing I got to using an aircraft and firefighting was when I was a young teenager learning to fly in ultralights and I was a volunteer firefighter. I would get a call and I would get overhead and call the the engine ahead and say yep we got a house on fire and and, and but that that yeah, that fire the fire service really helped groom me and it actually led to me seeking the the teamwork of getting in the military and and the the, the fellowship of uh, community uh interaction yeah and, exactly that's a really good way to put it because it's 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 great isn't it that it, it is. Camaraderie yeah. is very yeah. big to me. Camaraderie. I really miss it. And everybody knows their job and everybody's really good at it and committed. And um, I, I miss that a lot. That's what I love about this program is because we've got some loyal uh, supporters. Not all, not all of them sh tune in every single episode, but majority of them go back and look at the recording afterwards. And, you know, it's, it's really, it's really awesome to have that interaction and having folks participate on a common goal and that is you know safety of safety of flight or or doing something better so um yeah that's that's a, a really great rundown um so 
one of the questions that popped up in here was, is, uh, do you need to be, do, do they need old DC 10 MD 11 pilots? And uh, he's got almost 5,000 hours in the left seat. Well, you'd have to contact the DC 10 guys, you know, um, they, they do use the DC 10 on the fires. Um, I'm not sure who owns that company now, but um, sure. And of course to firefight, you know, they, they want low level time, mountain time, uh, bush flying, all of that comes into play. And that was when I did my interview, they wanted to know how much mountain time I had. I learned to fly in Alaska. So I had a lot of mountain time and a lot of bush time. And, um, and so they want that kind of experience or low level military time. Um, so if you have that, then absolutely go to the DC 10 and uh, yeah see what they got. I see another question there. What was the pay? Um, the pay is pretty good, but it is seasonal for all these jobs. Um, you know, the Cal Fire um, and all, all of them really are kind of based on seniority. So the more, uh, the higher seniority pilots would bid these uh, Southern California bases. The lower seniority pilots would get the Northern California bases. Southern California bases have a much longer season. So you make a lot more money. Um, you can be, you know, March through November easily. Sometimes it goes on longer than that. And the way the fires have been going now, it's, I think it's almost full time. Up north, it might start in April and end in the end of October. So you're making less money, but then you have more time off in the winter. So it's pretty, uh, there's a scale. It's hard to say exactly what you make, but the pay's good. And, uh, you know, you're not going to make, you're not going to get the same Pay as you would with the airlines, but at, in a way, it's it's probably pretty similar. It's just not quite as full time, um, but the benefits are good and all that. When you work for the Forest Service, which most firefighters, most aerial firefighters do, um, it's a different type of deal. You're working as a contractor. You're not employed by Cal Fire. You don't have the same benefits. I don't think you you know we had health care and pensions and you know everything. It was unionized which was great. And um, so very, very good to the pilots. Um, but the other Forest Service pilots are contract and they're in and out. I don't, plus they move around a lot. We were, we were at one base for most of the summer, even though sometimes we'd have to go to other bases, which was great. Um, but most of the time you spent the night at home. Um, and, but Forest Service pilots, they just go where the fires are. So it was quite a different, um, different deal but sounds like a really noble noble mission how about the mark the martin marsh did you ever get uh, it was at oshkosh back in 20 i know i talked to those guys and i was going to go for a flight and then they i think they hit a log in the water and had to make some repairs it was no big deal super nice guys yeah i would love to have flown that me too that's a big beast it's amazing I know, right i guess there were two at one time and then there was the one left and i think one's in a museum that's awesome um, so Eric, you got any questions? Yeah, I wanted to, um, I wanted to kind of bring it to some of the, um, the, the safety, um, of it. So you've got, obviously you've got an environment where, um, things are very dynamic and changing. You've got diverse aircraft and you probably rarely have anything but hostile terrain <laughs> underneath you. Um, you've got visibility you know, potential visibility issues. Yeah, visibility what, would be horrible. Well, so what are the strategies for even approaching that with any kind of safety? Well, it's all VFR flying, firefighting. Um, of course, we carried some approach plates, but generally it's it's all <clears throat> VFR flying. Sometimes um, you get to a fire and the smoke was so bad and so intense that, that you really couldn't um, bring in tankers to drop on the fire because they couldn't see anything. So you'd have to make that call. Um, and you know, it takes a lot of focus and experience. Um, the pilots that they hire are pretty experienced. Um, and you know, you, it's really up to you to stay, stay in a comfort level. You know, they, there are parameters, of course, that they give you, you know, each fire has a fire traffic area, what they call it. it's, it's, um, it's not usually TFR, um, but sometimes they are. But when the fires, when you go to initial attack and the fires first start and you're over there assessing it, you fly to this what's called a fire traffic area. And it starts 
um, I believe 12 miles out when you call in and you establish this, whoever's on the scene first establishes this traffic area. And it's like this kind of upside down kind of wedding cake thing. And so you'll have airplanes at all different levels. The tankers get the lowest. Um, and of course the helicopters get really, really low as well, but they're, they're stacked up. So the helicopters might be at 500 feet the tankers will circle at 1,200 feet less they're dropping then they get down to maybe 150 feet. Um, and then above that you have air attack so you can see everything. So we were usually flying at a couple thousand feet. Sometimes we get lower, but generally we're up higher. And then above that you have media. Um, you'd have helicopters come in and talk to you and say, hey, I'm, I'm gonna be hovering up here, but their cameras are so powerful. They can, they can stay pretty high and out of your way. So you have these layers and layers of of airplanes, it's actually very, very good system. It's pretty, it's pretty safe. Um, I think in the early days they had on, um, you know, a few mid airs and they've done everything they can to try and mitigate that. So people really stick to the rules and, uh, and don't, you know, but it's exciting too. I mean, the tankers will drop down these Canyon walls and just run downhill a Canyon wall and come out, you know, you're always looking for an out. So uh, it's pretty, it's pretty exciting flying. But it is. That, that does sound pretty amazing. You know, um, you hit on a couple of things about high risk operations. One, using you're flying low to the ground. You've got distractions. You're looking outside. You've got other aircraft that deconflict. You've got um, a multitude of radios to yeah. monitor. You know, you know where I'm going with this. And in, in, in my background with flying the 864s in combat, it's a it's a different animal than fighting fires, but it's the same type of environment. Um, when I went in the military, you know, I was, had a general aviation background. Uh, and when I got into army aviation, that's when I was first exposed to the composite risk assessment and, right. you know, identifying the hazards, you know, mitigating hazards and, and all of that sort of stuff. Can you elaborate a little bit on what kind of risk assessment processes you had to, you know, utilize when you were doing that? Uh, and was that your first go at using any kind of formalized risk assessment process? Um, that's a good question. I, I, I have always used risk assessment processes, but I've always worked for myself. I have been in systems like I worked for, I was a contractor for Raytheon and Beechcraft flying their airplanes. And so I was um, given a lot, you know, we had a lot of briefings and so on about their risk management process. But, you know, being an air show pilot, every air show is basically a risk management, you know, a risk assessed uh, arena. We start with a briefing. You don't fly unless you get briefed. Everything is discussed. Um, terrain, you know, I, I get up there and I drive up and down the runway where I'm going to do the ribbon cut. Are there, are there obstacles? So everything starts a couple of days before you get there early, you get some sleep, you get up, you have a practice day, you look at the terrain, you figure out where you're going to fly. Am I going to, is it, is it hilly? Are there obstacles? Sometimes there are, where's the box going to be? How tight is it? Are there trees? Am I over the water? All of that kind of thing. And you get to a briefing, you get all your frequencies, you find out what the outs are, emergency, um, you know, backup, you know, situations, what do you do in case of an emergency? Who do you talk to? What do you say? That kind of thing. So really going into something like firefighting was pretty much what we, what I'd always, always been doing. Um, and so um, I know Cal Fire um, is very, very um, risk. They have a lot of risk management. They, there's a lot of briefings. The training is pretty superb. It, there's a lot of training every season. All the pilots go through it. They have check rides. Um, they're giving tests and it was intense. I mean, I had to lock myself in a hotel room for a couple of weeks before the first year, especially, and learn a lot about a very complicated airplane and then learn about their system. And I went to another school for two weeks um, just on how to assess fires in the air and flew in a number of different tankers and watched simulated fires and so on and so forth. So um, any, uh, the training is, is, um, is very, very good and very, um, you know, very intense, very detailed and, and everybody does it. So, so when you get into these situations, everybody knows what their job is, you know, and that's what's so nice. It's like the military. It was very kind of paramilitary. 
everybody knows what their job is. Everybody does their job. Um, if something happens, you have a glitch or a mechanical, or you do something like uh, I was out of my airspace, let's say, then you file a form. Um, I forget what the, the name of the form is, and it goes out to all the bases. And if it's something that you did, you keep it anonymous. They pretty much keep it anonymous. And like, oops, you know, um, this is what happened. Um, and so that everybody sees it. And every morning at the base, there's a briefing too. It starts up every single morning with a briefing. So lots of risk management. Awesome. It looks kind of wild, you know, like it looks like what's the movie, um, you know, always. And everybody's like, oh, there's a fire. We're going to go for it. Come on, Joe. Right. And it's not like that. But it is exciting, you know. It's right. Exciting, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, really and you have to have those processes in place because people were heavy midairs in the early days, you know. Right. Right. So do you... um. Do you brief on the, you mentioned briefing before air shows. Um, obviously there you can bring everyone who's going to be flying into one room and, and have a, have a briefing beforehand. Do you do that with aerial firefighting or? At your base, at your base, each base has um, the air attack uh, pilot, the ATGS, the tanker pilots, maybe a relief pilot, and then the, the people on the ground that are going to fuel and, and do the safety, you know, safety stuff on the ground so everybody briefs in the morning every day yeah i didn't know if you had any aircraft that came in from elsewhere yeah converge um, on the fire I, and then how do you do you have standardization basically that they're arriving it's, it's pretty standard for most of the bases um yeah i mean there are ground handlers firefighters who who work on the base for the summer and they bring in the airplanes fuel them up and yeah it's pretty standardized and then and then there's a lot of food at the bases. People are always cooking. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I was the only woman at the base. Well, there were some other women, but I was the only woman pilot. Uh, Cal Fire has several, has a few. But um, so I like to cook, but I didn't cook because I didn't want to be put in that role where, oh, the girl's going to cook. Right. Never cooked. But the guys love to cook. <laughs> so we ate a lot. It was great. But I'm going to yeah, kind of go down a bunny trail here off off script here because it's you, you touched on being a, a female and and a pretty much a male dominant environment what would you give um what kind of advice would you give to the ladies in aviation uh who's actually tuned in right now uh you know i mean women who want to fly find ways to fly and you know the airplane doesn't know the difference who's in the cockpit um i would say you know, there's a big support group out there and it's usually virtual. I mean, you might get to a tanker base or, or an airline or whatever, wherever you're flying and be the only girl in the room. But when you go home at night, you can get on Facebook and there's lots of women support groups and people vent like this guy. Can you believe this guy <laughs> asked the guy in the right seat for the fuel order when I'm in the left seat? You know, it happens to me all the time, that kind of stuff. And um, so there's a big support group. It's really good for women today that that you can really, you know, talk about it. And I mean, first and foremost, you have to have a sense of humor and it toughens you up a little bit, you know? And generally people are very um, respectful and they like having women around and all that, but there, there are some real challenges and there are some guys that are still pretty old school and they're not all old either, they're the young guys. And um, so you just have to have confidence in your own abilities and do the best you can as a pilot and you know, read a book. That's, that's really good advice. <laughs> read a book, but you know what I mean. Just get away from it. You're right. Compartmentalize yeah. it. Compartmentalize. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. That's really good. I mean, because it, like it, I said, it is surprising though, that it is still so, there is still a lot of prevalent sexism and there's yeah. still a lot of guys who feel that we're taking their jobs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and uh, like we don't have to work. Maybe I'll sit around and eat bonbons all day and somebody's going to support me. But um, yeah, so um, it's out there. We have to keep, I, I look at it as an education process, you know, it's like, well, you know, this is, this is the way we feel, this is the way it is. And I'm just going to do a better job than everybody else just to show them, right? Right. It gives me a little, you know, incentive. <laughs> <laughs> That's really good. I just figured we'd touch on that because you brought it up and we do have quite a few ladies who join in um, and, um, you know, they're looking 
they're looking up the role models like yourself. Uh, Tammy Schultz is another one. And so I just figured I would, you know, give you that opportunity to elaborate I on that. Your book. Thank you for, yeah, thank you for the opportunity. And her book was very, very good. It was very blunt about her experiences. And she, she dealt with a lot, right. a lot of that, you know, with the macho military guys and um, no offense to the military guys out there, but, right. um, but there are, you know, some people are just not mature. So she, I, I was really impressed with how, um, uh, how honest she was about her experiences. She's uh, definitely got that military side to her. And we, we see eye to eye on, on that because she's a fighter pilot and I was an attack pilot. And so, um, yeah, it, it's, it, it, she definitely had to deal with some barriers. And so, yeah, great topic to, to discuss because I want to, I want with this program, I'm, as I mentioned before, it's not just about safety and education. It's, it's about promoting going out and doing something, you know, better with yourself. And, you know, everybody has some sort of, uh, some people have barriers that they, poverty, some people have uh, yeah. sexism, racism, all of those sort of barriers. And, you know, it, it's, if I can help be a part of inspiring someone through someone else's experiences to go out and do something better with their lives. And then this is a, this is a good program. So. Yeah, for sure. That's great that you're doing that. And sometimes, you know, people, sometimes people that overcome challenges become, have much more character and um, do better in the long run because they have had to overcome something, especially when they're young. Um, So if you can, I mean, some people are more, you know, are survivors more than others, but if you can find a way to overcome the challenges that you're given, and we all have something, um, then you're going to be you're going to be a better person in the long run. One of the, you know, just a little bit about myself, and I hate to talk about myself, but you know, I was not a wealthy kid. I had to work for everything I ever had, and you know, I had to pretty much beg and borrow an opportunity to fly. And I swept, I mopped, I fueled airplanes for an hour here and an hour there, and if it weren't for people taking me under their wing and working with me and mentoring me, because I was in a small town in South Carolina where aviation was so far, uh, it was such a, like this top of this pyramid that, that I'll never be able to access. And if it weren't for the mentors that I had along the way to kick me in the tail and say, you need to do this, you need to do it, just bite the bullet, go, you know, take out loans, get an ROTC scholarship, do what you need to do but, you know, just go after your dreams. And so, you know, that's, that's, that's part of what I'm doing here. You know, that's interesting because I, I tell people, you know, young people that are like, oh, I don't know what to do. I'm like, just go start somewhere because <laughs> you'll find so many people that will help you in aviation. People are, you know, we're, we're sort of almost religious, you know, about aviation. And, yes. and you see somebody that's interested, that's, that's young and eager, and you just want to help them. Mm-hmm. And I think most people in aviation are like that. That's what I love about being an instructor is mentoring yeah. and, and yeah. coaching and, and guiding. But we kind of went down a bunny trail, but I think it's a good bunny trail to go down, you know. So I'll ask this question. Why don't you talk a little about one of your top emergencies that you ever experienced and that you're comfortable talking about if you want and um, lessons learned or what you would have done better or what you did good you think about that type of emergencies um and we can come back to it if you want you know yeah um most of the kind of more scary things in aviation to me have been weather related you know flying bfr only airplanes around the world really and just getting in horrible weather and you know trying to figure out my way out of it and you know you i get i think i become more conservative you know um rather than less um and um, so, you know, I have a few stories about that and getting lost in Alaska and the mountains, and, oh. you know, BFR, um, BFR and climbing up. And, um, I, in fact, I did, I did a podcast for AOPA for their, um, Aviation Safety Institute that Rich, Richard McSpadden, uh, runs. And I talked about one, um, when I just got, I just got my instrument rating and, um, my husband had a 185 and he let me go pick it up and or let me take it out to a small town that I lived in and pick up a really good friend. 
um, a girlfriend and um, we took off and we we're going to fly to Bethel. It's way out in Western Alaska. There's nothing out there. And, and we didn't have GPS at the time. We just had uh, uh, VORs, but the VORs were really few and far between. We had NDBs as well. And um, we got out and got in bad weather and um, near Togiak, Alaska and Southwest. And uh, we were going to go in the store. We we're going to go out to Bethel up the Kuskokoom River and then over to the Yukon River and then down through Fairbanks and then Mount McKinley or Denali and then back down. So this cir circular, this kind of circuit and see friends along the way and, and stuff. We'd both lived in some small villages. Anyway, we took off and um, I got lost and the weather was bad. And I'm like, oh. so I, um, and I had never flown actual instruments on, alone. And um, there are a lot of mountains around. So I just started climbing I'm like, well, I can land in the tundra and then maybe nobody will find us. I might wreck the plane. This is not a good option. So I start climbing and I knew that the top, because I had my sectional, you know, I knew the tallest mountain was about 10 something. And, um, and so I just kept climbing till I got above that and sort of circling where I thought I was safe and started heading back to the West. There's nobody, nobody to talk to. There's no rate, no radar, nobody on the radio. Um, and you're just on your own. And I'm picking up ice a little bit. I can see the ice on the tires. I'm like, oh. And um, there's no, of course, 185. You don't have any like, de-ice equipment. Right. And I remember just looking at my friend Sue saying, okay. And she's like, so I, I'm like, oh, don't worry. We're going back to Dillingham. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I just had to be really cool because of her, you know? And right. I could I'm like, I have to take care of her. I'm responsible for her. And um, that's the most important thing. And I had to exude confidence. And it was really good. I'm really glad that I had somebody with me. I mean, she might not be glad that she was in that situation. But um, but I was really, it gave me a focus. Like, okay, you know, just keep your keep your act together. And, and I kept um, heading to back to the east, actually. And um, finally, I see this little flicker in the VOR. And uh, I know where the mountains kind of end and where I can start descending. And I get Dillingham and I'm like, oh, great. Okay, it's like 60, 60 miles out. We were like a hundred something out and fly back to Dillingham. Anyway, it all ended up fine. And I got back there. I'm like, now I got to shoot an approach, you know, after all that. I'm like, oh, and I, I'd never done, a, I mean, I, of course, had my instrument rating and flew with my husband a lot, but I'd never done one alone by myself. Anyway, there's a big hole over Dillingham. I landed and I saw this, uh, I'm like tying the plane down. And um, I saw this guy I knew, he goes, oh, the weather's really crappy. How'd you get here? I'm like, oh, I just shot the, you know, I just you know, came in and I'm like, oh, it was IFR. And he's like, oh, cool. I'm like, yeah, it was really like, <laughs> I was like, like, figured out. Yeah, I'm really cool. Yeah, I just came in and they, you know, blah, 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 in the goo, you know, acted all <laughs> tough. <laughs> I know. I it off. <laughs> God, you know, you get yourself in these situations. Then you have to perform. What are you going to do? You can't give up. I will say that that is a nerve wracking feeling when you start to see ice appear, <sighs> especially when it's unforecasted. And you're over mountainous terrain and you can't descend and get out of it, you know. And I couldn't descend. And I, you know, I mean, I could have climbed a little bit, but it, it didn't matter. I mean, there was no de-ice stuff. And you always get ice in Alaska. So it was in the summer, you know, but. Right. <laughs> I survived. Thank goodness. Yeah. And live to tell his tale. Yep. And yep. I'm still here. Answer. I'm still here. Exactly. Yep talking to us tonight looking at the uh, comments that sounds terrifying yeah it was kind of terrifying it was more terrifying afterwards thinking about it it's more terrifying now than yeah, at the time, time to think about it time i really had to keep it together yeah no but uh let me see what else oh Stephen david look forward to seeing you again in ocean reef this december oh yeah me too <laughs> i'm looking forward to that too my cousins are there and it'll be great Hey, Joe, and one of my students, Joe McMurray. Awesome. Talk about your first air show and your taxi incident afterwards. Should I answer those questions? Is <laughs> answer that, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, 
So Joe wants to know about my first air show, my taxi. Oh yeah. So that wasn't my first air show. My first air show was in Alaska and uh, in Golcana. And I was so shy. I'm still shy, but um, I've had to get over a lot of it. But um, my, I had a decathlon. I took off and I, you know, it was really high and I did my little routine and then I landed and the announcer um, said, and there she is, you know, and I'm like, Oh my God, this is like, I just want to fly. I don't want to have to be waving at people. And so I taxied and I found a hangar and I just went in and I hid. People couldn't find me. <laughs> it was my first year. So they go, where is she? I'm like, I don't want to go out there. <laughs> and Joe, um, Joe McMurray, um, he's one of our students. He has a decathlon and uh, it's beautiful. And he's, he posts a lot of really cool video on Facebook and stuff. Um, so I flew a couple little shows in Alaska. Then I flew down to Fond du Lac, Wisconsin to compete in my first contest. And I really enjoyed air shows a lot, flying air shows, probably more than the competition. That was really nerve wracking. Shows were fun. And at the end of the contest, they said, do we have any volunteers to fly a little show? Because the Fond du Lac contest was the IEC championships and was held almost concurrent with Oshkosh. And I said, yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it. So I go up there and I taxi or do my little show and then I land and I had a smoke tank in the back of the decathlon, but it was empty. So I was kind of light in the tail and I'm looking out and there are all these people waving at me. And so I'm waving and I had a little tailwind and I relaxed the back pressure on the step. Rookie, rookie mistake, typical rookie mistake. And, and then I saw the gas pumps coming up. So I hit the brakes and in front of all these people where I'm waving, the tail came up and it got the prop and I ended up on my nose. I'm like, oh my God, what do I do? I was so embarrassed. And this really sweet man, Herb Cox, he was involved in IEC competition. I really miss him. He came over and I said, he goes, you have to get out and wave at the crowd. I said, there's no way. <laughs> I'm getting out of this plane and wave at that crowd. They go, no, no. He was so cool. He said, no, they'll think it's part of the act. They think it's all part of it. They don't know. And I'm like, oh, really? Okay. Of course they <laughs> did. Sure. And I got out and waved. Hey. Oh my God. So, you know, we had to have the it, I didn't have to replace the engine. That was the good part. Yeah, that was embarrassing. But it, let's know, just like a cat. My students. What is that? Just like a cat. You meant to do that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. <laughs> But I, it's a good thing because I can tell my students like, you know, hey, it happens to all of us. <laughs> you know? So, yeah. <laughs> See you later, Joe. So there was um, <laughs> there, there was there was a question. I'm going to kind of summarize it from the uh, from the Q&A here. But what's um, what's what's captured your interest right now? What's 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 current and what's next? Well, I'm really busy. Um, of course, the school takes a lot of time and it's really fun. We have great students. And um, and I've been working on videos of sporties. I'm so excited about that. We just came out with our, it came out the first one in February. We have a whole course. We have three videos it's called Basic Aerobatics. Um, it's uh, introduction to aerobatics, basic maneuvers, loop, roll, spin, and then combinations of those like a half Cubanade and Immelman and those maneuvers. And so we get you up to pretty, you know, primary basic level of aerobatics in the course. And we do, um, we use a decathlon, we use the extra for some of the maneuvers, and we also use an RV6. So people can learn how to do aerobatics. I mean, we're, we assume you have a CFI and we're helping you with your, you know, instruction. We're not, it's not in cockpit, but um, we're showing you how to do aerobatics with a non-inverted system airplane too. So um so I'm super excited about that. And I'm working on a tailwheel checkout video for sporties and uh, advanced aerobatics and a couple of others. So it's, it's time consuming and it's really exciting. And then um, I've got a few air shows coming up. I've got, um, none of us have too many air shows this year because of COVID, but we're starting to get back into it. And I've got Battle Creek, Michigan coming up and then Oshkosh and a couple of others. And, uh, and I just got a new puppy. Awesome. <laughs> Busy with my puppy. Yeah. She's really cool. What kind of puppy is it? I it's think I saw mini, it on Instagram. Yeah. It's a mini Husky. Okay. She's beautiful. Yeah. Cool. I would get her, but she'd be all over the place. So, <laughs> so anyway, that's what I'm doing and uh, working out and, you know, the usual stuff. 
Stay oh, and I'm reading a great book. Can I can I tell yeah, people? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So I'm reading this book that I found. It's called Hard Landing. And uh, I've made a few of those. But this is not yes. about that. It's about the epic contest for power and profits that plunged the airlines into chaos. So it talks all about the early airlines, the players, pre-deregulation, after deregulation. Uh, it's it's so good. I can't put it down. It's really fascinating. I'm about to have the uh, author. The author is Tom Petzinger Jr. And uh, he's a fabulous writer. You know, you pick up a lot of these books and they're sort of like tedious and you can only get through parts of them. This one I can't put down. It's just really good. So, and then I read another book, an awesome book the other day. I'm going to go get it. Okay. Take your time. Okay. Um, and this is called, and again, there's a lot of these books written by people. They're not that well written. This is, I couldn't, I, I couldn't put it down. It's called, is this, backwards what you're reading but a cargo pilot and it's tales from corrosion corner by brett lane it's amazingly written and there's a section in here about my dad who was a freight dog after he retired from the airlines he's pretty wild and uh pretty crazy stories actually and uh he never told me any of that stuff you know but uh but he was so uh, there's a whole section in here these are all about dc sixes and sevens flying out of fort lauderdale in miami and you know delivering shoes and you know reptiles and stuff to all over central america south america dominican republic and and uh this whole so you know pretty good that's pretty great, cool. book. great book anyway that's pretty awesome yeah really 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 well, cool. Well, we got time for a couple more questions. All right. I'll answer a couple more. I struggled there, sickness quite at the beginning. Um, every, a lot, not everybody, but a lot of people do struggle with their sickness. Um, and no, I don't think females are more susceptible. I think, I think women usually do better with their sickness in, in my experience. Um, you know, it's just one of those things you just have to push through. A lot of times we get students who are sick the first day, not sick, but they feel a little nauseated, a little icky. The first couple of flights, by the second day, they're feeling fine. Um, occasionally somebody has um, more of a challenge, you know, find it, finds it more of a challenge and takes them a couple of days, but I've never seen anybody that couldn't get past it. So if, if aerobatics is something you want to try, I would say, don't just do one flight or two, do four or five, try and push past it. I'm gonna ask this quick question. How did you get into aerobatics? I went to an air show in a contest and said, you know, that that looks really cool. That's what did it, huh? That's what I wanna do, yeah. My sister's an airline pilot. I didn't wanna do that. Um, and uh, I, uh, I wanted to do something exciting. That was like everything I loved combined into one. Traveling, being upside down, hanging on monkey bars, you know, challenge, a challenge that is with you your whole life. You never get, you never get to the point where you can't practice or learn something. Awesome. So. I think a similar, that, that brings back memories uh, for when I were, I first fell in love with flying and that was, uh, you know, I was an older guy. I was, I was teenagers, uh, 15 when I got my first airplane ride. And I think the first time I saw the horizon after we broke you know, in, in South Carolina, we broke on the climb out and got above the trees. That was when it hit me. Oh, yeah, that's right. That, that was it. It was immediate. I remember feeling my jaw drop. Yeah. Because uh, I was terrified of flying up until that point, believe it or not. You've probably never been in a small plane. I hadn't uh, at all. You, would you believe I was a CFI double I and had not flown in a commercial airliner? Really? I That's know. unusual. I know. I, I told you, I, I came from a small I farm. Look out. Carolina. I know. I, I was, a, I was a, I, I, general aviation. It was a Cessna 177 Cardinal. Small town boy. That's it. 36 in my high school class. <laughs> Seriously. And here you are now talking to people from all over the world. Exactly. And I love it. I love it. And it's just. And that's uh, what aviation does for you. You know, it opens. And, and, up and the military and the military. 
yeah. military and aviation together have really shaped my life and firefighting, which is exactly why I wanted to, to talk to you about that because that really kind of piqued my interest. Um, I'd like to let you close out. I know that uh, we agreed on, a, you know, having, we, we've got a lot of questions from guests and everything. Um, you know, the questions have been amazing. Uh, I'd love to have you back in the future if you want to come back. Um, I know you and I are supposed to meet up um, down in St. Augustine sometime soon, um, but I'd love to let you close it out and um, we'll shut it down for tonight. Thank you. Um, so, you know, just what we were saying, aviation has given me everything in life, really, really has. Um, I'm so glad that I, that I took that route. You know, I can't imagine. I, I've flown all over the world. I have instant friends all over the world. It's like when you're an IAC member, an EAA member, you can go anywhere. And you instantly have friends, you know, and that's the way aviation is. And it's this great equalizer. You know, you, you have a row of hangers, you have a billionaire on one end, and you have a guy that built a RV in his, you know, basement, and everybody comes together. And there's, there's this great, you know, equalizer with aviation. So um, I sure would encourage anybody to get into it. And uh, I've been really lucky. You know, Thank it's you. It's a lot of work, but it's really lucky. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you for uh, everything you've done for aviation, your contributions to uh, promoting you. aviation. Um, we're, I'm going to get down to St. Augustine and we're going to go have a blast. Yeah, and, I'm going to see you soon, I think. Yeah, we, we're on the calendar for uh, mid next month. All right. So I'll have to get with you about that and some other things. Um, you know, you said something about how you can go to all these uh, different events and you instantly have friends. You know, we did a 900, almost a 900 nautical mile cross country in that little Luscombe uh, over the last five days. And we stopped at nine different airports along the way. And every single airport, you know, there was always someone that wanted to check the airplane out, wanted to talk about flying. It's just such a. That would have taken you home for the night if they. If they you would have. <laughs> they would have. Absolutely. You're, in, you're instantly amongst family. Yeah, you really are. It's a, it's an amazing community. And you took your little boy, right? I did. I took my oldest son, Adam, he, he was 12. Wow. That's, did he fly a lot? I let him hold the controls as we crossed the Mississippi and <laughs> we, we had, he, he held the controls. It's in Aluskum and his feet doesn't quite fit the uh, rudder pedals. And of course you've got to be on the rudder the entire time, but he flew it. And I'm not trying to push it on him. I, I want him to develop his own love for it. But he lo he just loves to hang out with dad and, and meet dad's friends. That is cool. <laughs> That's great. Congratulations. Thank you. And thank you again for coming tonight. I'll close this out and we'll, we'll be in touch. Thanks. I'll see you all soon. And thank you very much for having me. Absolutely. All right. Patty Wagstaff, once again, for the second time. Thank you, Patty, for joining us. Um, and thank you to the viewers who have joined in tonight. If you got any questions for me, shoot me a note at flyallamerican at gmail.com. Follow me on social media, YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. Come back and join us on May 11th as we have uh, the president and CEO from the Helicopter Association International, uh, James Viola. James Viola is a former Army aviator and is now the president of the Helicopter Association. So he'll be here May 11th. Once you have tasted flight, you will always walk the earth with your eyes turned towards the sky and where you have been and where you will always long to return. That's Leonardo da Vinci. Thanks again, everybody, for showing up tonight. Come back on May 11th. Shoot me notes. Share the information and come back to see us. Have a wonderful night. Fly safe. Keep learning. Never give up on a dream. God bless. Good night, everybody.